I'd like to call the first meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board, new school board, to order. We're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. As it is our first meeting, it is my duty to ask if there are any nominations for board chair. Uh, it is my privilege to nominate Mary Townsend for school board chair. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you. Are there any further nominations? You mean any discussion? No, I mean any further nominations. <laughs> Seeing none, I will call nominations closed. Is there, is there any discussion on nominations? Mr. Christie. Um, I just wanted to, to cite some reasons for uh, my nomination of, of uh, Mary Townsend. Mary has led the school board and the district through a challenging year with tenacity and grace. She has helped guide a process by which the board, the administration, and the town have become more effective stewards of our district accomplishing some significant goals along the way. Last spring, Mary led a process which produced a budget that was endorsed by 72% of Cape voters. Also last spring, Mary led the board's part in selecting two clear goals for the district, literacy learning and the development of professional learning communities. Under Mary's leadership, the board confronted the most critical task of any school board, the selection of a superintendent. Mary conducted a search which involved all community stakeholders, reached nationwide for candidates, and tapped the expertise of the administration. Mary invested countless hours into this selection. When necessary, she had the courage to reopen the process. The community owes Mary a deep debt of gratitude for this tireless service, which ultimately produced an excellent fit in Meredith Nadeau. And Cape has already expressed that gratitude. While she ran for re-election unopposed, it is worth noting that Mary received the endorsement of more Cape voters than any other person or referendum on the ballot, a fact which speaks to the public's confidence in her stewardship. Beyond these accomplishments, it is a great pleasure to work with Mary. She is thoughtful, approachable, and respectful. She brings tireless commitment and a warm sense of humor to her work. Mary's expectations for our district are high, for she is ever mindful of the full potential of our students. For all these reasons, I am honored to nominate Mary Townsend for another term as chair. Any further discussion? Seeing none, call for a vote. All those in favor of the nomination of Mary Townsend for chair of the Cape Elizabeth School Board? Vote is 7-0. Congratulations, Chairwoman Sam. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That was very kind. I appreciate that. And it's been a pleasure to, uh, to be on the board, and it was an honor to chair last year. Um, and I'm looking forward to this year. We have a tremendous board, and um, everyone has their own individual strengths that they bring to the table, and hopefully we'll be able to plug those in um, in the most effective way possible. And so I will continue on with the nominations. Do we have a nomination for board vice chair? Uh, yes, I move for the, uh, uh, I nominate uh, John Christie as a board vice chair. Do I have a second? Elizabeth? Um, any further nominations? Yeah. Discussion? Uh, yes. Um, uh, John was uh, the uh, board vice chair last year, and uh, given uh, the progress we've made, I think it's important that we have continuity in leadership. Uh, John was uh, the finance chair and also involved with the negotiations committee. He's uh, fantastic at, at listening and providing a calm, uh, long-term uh, perspective on the district. and. Um, I think it would be uh, uh, a great opportunity to have uh, John and uh, support Mary and the board as vice chair. Any further discussion? 
Um, all those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. It'll be a pleasure to serve with you again. Um, I have appointments of committees. These are lumped together. I'd like to suggest that we um, consider these separately. Um, the first is for finance chair. Um, do I have a nomination for finance chair, please? David? Uh, I'd like to nominate Michael Moore to be chairman, chairperson of the finance committee. Do I have a second? Eight. Um, do I have any other nominations for finance chair? Okay. Any discussion? Um, I, I did add my, Michael for some information so I can say as many nice things about him as everybody else about, but he refused to give me very much. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know shyness was allowed on this board. <laughs> Anyways, um, Michael is eminently qualified to be, and he has at least 15 years experience in the field of finance and accounting. Um, he's been involved on some extremely complex, in his career, extremely complex uh, financial matters. In his year or so on the board, he's delved into the budget and uh, budgetary type issues as well as anybody and understands it as well as anybody on a, on a various finance committee meeting. So I, I think he has the expertise and the willingness and the deftness which one asks budget questions uh, as well as anybody. So I'm pleased to uh, support his nomination. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Are you going to raise your hand? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Congratulations, Michael. And thank you for serving as uh, finance chair. I agree with all that David said. I think you're going to be fabulous. Um, all right, policy. Um, it's our um, final standing committee. Uh, do I have a nomination for chair of policy? Kate. Um, I would like to nominate John Christie for policy committee, chair of policy committee. Okay, do I have a second? Michael. Um, any other nominations? Okay. All right. So any discussion? I would like to, the reasons why I'd like to um, nominate John is, as Michael said, um, not to repeat what Michael said, but to add, his work our ethics are perfect to step into the um, position of committee uh, chair of the policy committee. John is diligent, sincere, and kind. And I think those are the perfect qualities in which he will help the superintendent, the administration, and our community raise uh, really uh, directly affect the children's learning and community um, character traits that policy of, of what policy committee um, is the base of for the backbone. Mm -hmm. John, you'll be perfect. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. Any other discussion? Um, I'd just like to set the record straight that um, the 71 percent of the public that voted for the budget had to do with John being finance chair, not me being chair. <laughs> John did a fabulous job, and he does a fabulous job at everything he does, and I am quite sure he will be um, a wonderful chair for policy, and we have a lot on our plate this year, so support that Thank nomination. You, okay, all those in favor? Okay, so um, I'm going to suggest with committee appointments and the advisory committee appointments that we um, look at those as a slate. Madam Chair, you can name the slate and then call for a motion if you choose to do that. I can't hear you. I said as chair, you can name the slate and then call for a motion from the board. Okay. Would you like me to name each? Up, um, all right, I'll do that because there are only There's a few. A and these, are, these will be posted on the web. For committee appointments, um, we have a slate um, from the caucus um, for the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, Michael Moore, the Health Insurance Task Force, David Hillman and Michael Moore, um, Main School Management Association Delegate, David Hillman, Paths General Advisory Board, Kate Williams Hewitt, Technology Steering Committee, John Christie, Transportation and Appeals Committee, Kate Williams-Hewitt, 
um, <coughs> advisory committee uh, committees are as follows. Buildings and Grounds, Kate Williams Hewitt, Legislative Liaison, David Hillman, Positive Action Committee, Kate Williams Hewitt, Co-Curricular um, Steering Committee, Elizabeth Seifries, Athletic Steering Committee, Joanna Morrissey. Um, do I have a motion to accept this slate? Mary, could I add, I, I think we have to vote on the appointment of two members to the Policy Committee. Uh, Joanna Morrissey. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we will add those to the slate. Is that okay? All right. So do I have a motion? Um, I move that we appoint uh, to the committees the individuals listed by Mary with the addition of uh, Joanna Morrissey and Elizabeth. Help me with your last name. Seyfries. Uh, to the policy committee um, as listed by Mary. Okay. Second. Okay. Any discussion? I, I have one question. Yes. Um, it's just a technical question, but I'm a committee of one in two instances. Is that possible? <laughs> or is that a sign of my <laughs> inability to get along with everybody? <laughs> Not only that is, I, I don't understand how I'm a, a delegate to main I, school I would call or the a testimony to your ability to do the work of an entire committee, David. Yep. Oh, that's kind of you. But <laughs> I mean, technically, they're not committees. Legislative liaison is not a committee, and school delegates not a committee. But that's oh, okay with me. I had to ask. Um, I would just like to say that in, in the caucus, I think we worked very hard to find committees for everyone's strengths, and I feel very confident with this board, with the placement um, uh, that we have of people on committees, including David's two one-man committees. <laughs> so any further discussion? All those in favor? All right, so that ends the, the voting portion of our, our, uh, of our meeting, and we'll move on to item number two, adjustments to the agenda. Are there any adjustments? David. Um, I wanted to raise an issue, and I guess it would be considered an adjustment to agenda, and then suggest that maybe we appoint some people to look into it. And the issue is whether or not we should have um, the school board should have iPads in order to connect us to the school. There's at least two reasons for it, since I'm adding this to the agenda, I don't think it needs to be approved, but one, of, one reason is that there's been a, South Portland does it and has found that it, the cost savings is three or four times the cost of the, um, uh, in the first year than the cost of the iPads. And secondly, um, the, talking briefly with Gary Lenoy, uh, he gave me a perfect example of why it's highly efficient to do it. You, whatever documents we have here, not only we have on our iPad, we can make comments and questions and answers to questions right on the iPad, then it's stored on the cloud. So we never have to worry about note taking and losing our notes. So there is, and I'm sure he'd come up with 15 more reasons why we should have it. So I, I guess as an agenda item, I would like to suggest that we uh, maybe have Meredith take a look at it and present at a future board meeting the pluses and minuses of us having um, that purchase for, uh, iPads purchase for the school board. So if I'm understanding you correctly, we will move this to a future agenda. I wanted to raise it as an agenda item now that we will, mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's agenda item two. The, the item is to open an investigation by Meredith into the, um, and if, uh, the viability and feasibility of us having an iPad. Okay. All right. So um, we, I think it makes sense for us to discuss it um, at our next agenda planning meeting then, um, which will be the end of this month. And I'll get back to you about that. But thank okay. you for bringing that up, David. I think that's um, worth looking into. Okay. Um, any other adjustments or? Agenda items. Okay. We'll move on to number three, approval of school board minutes from the regular meeting Tuesday, November 8th, 2011. Um, do I have a motion? 
I move for the approval of the school board minutes from the regular meeting on Tuesday, November 8th, 2011. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? All right, 7 0. All right, we will move on now to item number four comments from our student reps. Um, who do we have? So I'm coming forward right now ah, in the middle school. All right. Hi, my name is Gabby Raymond. And I'm Hans Croft. In the upcoming weeks, winter vacation starts on the 23rd, meaning we go to, we go to a full day of school on the 22nd and we get back from vacation on January 3rd. Also, girls basketball registration has already begun and ends on the 23rd. Swimming and indoor track registration for 7th and 8th graders starts on January 9th and for 6th graders February 8th. January 16th is Martin Luther King Jr. Day and the variety show from the middle school is on January 11th. The theme of the month is substance abuse. We are having assemblies for the 7th and 8th grade. We've already had one assembly. Neil McLennan came and talked to the two grades last Friday. On January 9th, Matt Braun is coming to talk to the 7th and 8th graders about the results of sub substance abuse. He was a former Cape High School student. Also on January 13th, we're having brothers that juggle come to our school. They will be talking to grades 5 through 8 about making healthy choices. That night at 7, they will be performing a longer and different act than the one done at the school that, that day. They, will be, they welcome anyone in Cape to come, and it costs $5. Recently, recently we had the second dance. To get, to get in, we did a fundraiser. You could bring in books or could bring in winter clothes, such as winter jackets, boots, or snow pants. We made back all the money that it cost to have the dance, and we got lots of items to donate to the less fortunate students at the Reiki School. That's all. Thank you. Um, so the winter sports season has begun. Um, the National Honor Society is selling candy cane grams. Um, the Haiti Club is collecting shoes. Um, the Wellness Committee put on the Chef of the Month event just today, actually. We had Flatbread's Pizza come and serve us lunch, which was delicious. Um, the Environmental Club began CNET training, um, which means that they will monitor the health of birds on the beach. Um, the uh, graduation committee had their first annual jingle fest, so a bunch of students and parents got together and went on a walk with jingle bells and ate hot chocolate and cookies after. It was very enjoyable. Um, and the robotics team won the Southern Maine tournament and is now going on to the World's Tournament. I Use this one if I can reach it. Okay. Um, so Sasha said basically everything I was going to say, except for our mock trial team um, won states against Hampton Academy, and that was really exciting. And now we are moving on to nationals in New Mexico. So yeah, that's basically all I had to say. Okay. Thank you, Sasha and Abby. There's a lot going on in the high school right now. Yeah. Um, okay, so comments from, we'll move on to number five, comments from the public on agenda items. Are there any comments from the public on items that are on the agenda? No? Okay. Let's move on to number six, recognition. Um, Item A, Fall Athletics. Jeff Thorak will present to us. Hello. Um, I just want to take an opportunity to congratulate all of our fall uh, athletic teams in the middle school and in the high school. Um, congratulations to our student athletes, our coaching staff on another uh, outstanding season. It's interesting when I'm doing these reports, I'm always, I always reflect upon 
just how impressive our student athletes are at Cape Elizabeth. Um, the things that they do, not only on the field, but off the field, whether it be student government, the clubs, working, volunteering in the community. Um, and then, on the athletic field, having to, um, of a school size of about 100, 100 less students than a lot of our other competitors, um, to be as successful as they, as they are. Um, and for some odd reason, it's whenever a team wants to play, or whenever a team plays Cape Elizabeth, there's, um, it seems like they're always playing their best game. They want that, uh, that victory over Cape Elizabeth. And uh, so they're always bringing a strong performance, and uh, our student athletes always respond to those challenges. So um, I uh, just wanted to congratulate all of our fall athletic teams. Um, this fall at the high school level, we had um, a number of individual accomplishments that I, I did want to recognize. We had 26 conference all-stars and 16 senior scholar athletes. Um, and in the high school senior class, I believe there were 52 seniors participating in a, in a fall sport, so that was about 30%. So that's a pretty impressive number. Um, and then there's a few extra uh, state and national recognitions that we would like to um, note as well. I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, Peter Doan on his New England cross country qualifying. And um, Peter finished, he was the 22nd main runner across the finish line, so that was, that was special. Um, Western Maine Conference uh, Golfer of the Year was uh, Reese McFarlane, who's a freshman at Cape Elizabeth. Um, Donald Clark uh, is a semi-finalist for the James J. Fitzpatrick Award, and that award goes to the top senior football player in the state. Uh, the, Nat the National Soccer Coaches Association of America recognized uh, Melanie Vangel as a uh, member of the All New England team and the Maine Soccer Coaches Association has a uh, class a, Western Maine Class A All-Star list, which in, included Tim LaValle, Blake Barrett, Melanie Vangel, and Maddie Riker. And then, in addition to that, there's a Western Maine All-State team, um, and Tim LaValle and Mel Melanie uh, Vangel were uh, recipients of, uh, of that award. And then, most recently, uh, Melanie was also selected to the All-State um, Portland Press Herald and Maine Sunday Telegram All-State team. And another note, um, not necessarily a fall item, but we're uh, really happy for uh, Timmy LaValle, who signed his national letter of intent to uh, play lacrosse at P Providence College Division I program. So um, it's a really special moment for Timmy and his family, and we're really proud of him. And, oh, I do have, I was a little late getting this to the um, agenda, so if you want to, it's just a brief summary, you can take one and pass it on of some of the team and individual accomplishments. Um, any comments, questions for Jeff? I'd just like to thank you again and again and again for all of your work with our student athletes. I think we have a tremendous program and it, um, you're the fulcrum of that. And, Really appreciate all of your, your countless, countless hours. Okay, so um, let's move on to mock trial. I think we have our mock trial captains here, the Muscat sisters and Katie Page. If you'll introduce yourselves for the camera, that would be great. Hi, I'm Katie Page. I'm Claire Muscat. And I'm Emily Muscat. Um, so I guess I'll start. Um, just to give a little bit of background, um, the, we are three out of five captains. Max Aronson and Will McCarthy have also been wonderful captains with us. And for the past three months, basically, we've been working on the same case for mock trial. Um, the case, to give you a summary, um, the vice president of um, a paper company was murdered, and this is all, this is all fictional. And um, the prime suspect is the leader of this environmental group um, who, uh, and he's, he, it was a she in our case, is the main um, suspect because this person had a lot of problems with the paper company's environmental practices. So we all took on different roles. Um, Claire was a witness, Katie and I were both lead attorneys. 
and we won five trials in order to win the state championship, which is a lot harder than it seems. Each trial, um, we had to miss a day of school for it, and it took, they take about four hours. They're really, they're long, and they get really competitive. And our last one on um, just five days ago, the state championship last Thursday, um, was really, really intense. And uh, luckily for Katie, Claire, and I, it's our second time um, with the opportunity to go to nationals. So yes, as Abby said, nationals are in New Mexico, Albuquerque this year. And we went last year, and they're in Phoenix, actually. And it was not only a really incredible learning experience, mock trial-wise, but one of the best weekends of my life, and probably the best too. Honestly, it was so much fun. I love the Southwest. And um, I would love to go back as well. So we will be looking for donations from the community. We're gonna, we have a, a sophomore, Kevin Hare, has already begun the fundraising process. He, he uh, appointed me the head of the bake sale committee, so I'm very flattered. Um, but we do really, really need funds, and I would love to go to nationals again and represent Maine in the national competition, and it would be such an honor to do it again, so we would love donations for that. <laughs> yeah, we'd also like to thank our coaches, um, Mr. Hillman and Mr. Shedd, who are present here tonight. Also, my mom, Ms. Page, and Coach O'Meara. Uh, we'd also like to thank the parents and the community for their support and their future support at Nationals. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, girls. Um, before they leave, can I say something? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, get, get ready, girls. You didn't think you didn't think you're gonna get a, you didn't think you're gonna get a pass, did you? Um, they're vastly understating the amount of effort that's involved. This was the first year I got a chance to do it from beginning to end. Last year I got drafted through the Nationals. It's the first chance I had to see what an entire season lasts like. It's actually 10 trials because they have to play, present, uh, uh, do one trial whether the prosecution, they have to do the next trial whether the defense. Uh, so you have to, it's the classic case of a lawyer arguing out of both sides of the mouth, so they have to do it in two back-to-back -back trials. It is, um, it is an enormously time-intensive project. Um, uh, the students act as witnesses, they act as lawyers, they act as timekeepers. Witnesses are just as important as lawyers. The witnesses in the, in the um, prize trial or the finals, uh, quite frankly, I thought were outstanding. Um, they have to be as good because they basically have to joust with the lawyer who's cross-examining them. Um, the co two coaches, I mean, Jeff and I did do a fair amount of work, but uh, Dick O'Meara and uh, Mrs. Page put in, I, I can't even think of the amount of hours they put in a week. There must be 20, 25, 30 hours a week on this. It is extremely intense. The competition is extremely intense this year because the amount of people, the amount of towns competing in it has grown geometrically. And uh, Hamden, the team that uh, they beat, I had won it for seven years in a row or something like that to last year when we beat him, and then we beat him again this year. And I did go to this final, and quite frankly, um, the first trial was close, the second trial was not. Um, Cape has really become very dominant, and I, and I have to tell you, it's immensely hard work. And what's good about this, unlike some extracurricular activities, or even, quite frankly, some classrooms, we can teach them all we can. We teach them about the rules, we teach them, help them with what kind of questions to ask, what kind of ways to answer it. But once you get in a trial, anything can happen. People forget things, objectives come out of the blue, you don't even think about, it's real life. And they have to do critical, critical thinking on their feet. It's probably the best example of real life learning as we'll get in our school system. And uh, it was a joy to watch the um, uh, trial held in, the, in what's called the law court, or the main Supreme Court, known as the law court. Um, the poise um, uh, of people, a lot of the, the whole team in terms of how they ask questions, how they respond to pressure, when judges made absolutely bozo rulings, which happens in real life, um, how they dealt with it. It was, it, was, uh, it was a real pleasure. I really felt that the hours I put in um, were well worth my time. I'm sure Jeff feels the same way, and Dick and Mary do, and they put in an enormous amount of work. But quite frankly, as 
interesting as a few of you can be, it has been a, it has been an extreme pleasure to coach you, and I think this is probably some of the best preparation you're going to get for life. And you guys have done great, and, and I hope we do well in the nationals. Thank you, David, and thank you for taking your time. And thank you uh, to the whole team. It was I had the pleasure of sitting through all five hours, and it was absolutely riveting all five hours watching these kids perform. Um, I was so proud to be a parent um, in the audience, and actually, it was packed. The courtroom was it was a big courtroom, and it was packed full of parents and. Um, some people just came in from, you know, being out in the lobby to watch the kids um, argue their cases. And so, um, and Meredith came and joined for a bit. Um, it was um, absolutely, um, it made me very proud to be a community member in Cape Elizabeth. So you all did wonderfully and congratulations. And um, I, uh, I hope you guys will um, do well in nationals. And, um, get your funds raised, so keep us posted. We should mention one other thing that one of our student reps on here, Abby Donnelly, is a member of the team. Um, started off the trial with one of the toughest roles and, and quite frankly did a great job. And I think as, as Coach O'Meara said in his comments, set the, between the, her, her direct examination, I think with Chelsea did the opening, set the standard by which everybody had to measure up to. And, and, you should be congratulated. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Okay. It was Chelsea Why Not, sorry. All right. So um, moving on to, if there are no other comments, um, moving on to item C, robotics. I'm very excited about this. We get an exciting demonstration, too. <coughs> I know. Yes, uh, my name is Evan Thayer. I'm the uh, advisor to the robotics team. I have the great pleasure of uh, sneaking into our robotics lab um, occasionally during the day and seeing what's been built there and snapping some pictures of some uh, interesting creations of students. But um, thinking that a picture is worth a thousand words and a, a video must be 10,000 or so, and so I'm going with the demonstration being worth about 100,000 words. So um, I'd like to have uh, a couple of our teams come up. Um, and maybe just demonstrate what they built in front here, if that's okay. So, um, in fact, I'd like all our, our team members to come up, but the two we've got that will work for you tonight are uh, Luke Dvorak and Anthony Castro with uh, one of our teams that they'll be going to the world. And you can start your process of, of uh, coming up if you like. And then also the middle school team, 56D, uh, Matt Brucker and Kyle Long and Will Corsello and Matt Hufford are here tonight um, to demonstrate that. Uh, this pair here, or this alliance of teams, it didn't have to be a um, Cape Cape alliance at our, um, at our recent tournament in Southern Maine, um, but the Luke and Anthony, uh, being the team that uh, came on top after the morning rounds, chose these guys because they have a very good robot. And at that point, they just did exceedingly well in the elimination rounds. Now the wheels are falling off. We're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> sort of like us about 9 o'clock. Right. While these guys uh, set up, we also have um, on this, over on the side, we have uh, Jasper Hansel and Ian Schrank and Leah Parrish and Andrew Valent. <laughs> And the first three of those were on a team that won a programming skills award as well. So we did, um, I think we did the school very proud and these guys did, these guys did themselves proud. We get to keep these when it's done, don't we? Take them home. <laughs> Christmas presents. While they're setting up, I just, I also had the opportunity to attend the robotics tournament at the University of Southern Maine and Evan coordinated the Southern Maine tournament itself. So he didn't only coach these teams, but he also took on the job of um, facilitating the tournament, helping to recruit the volunteers. And we have a number of, well, at least a few volunteers who are here tonight. Um, and the time and effort put, put into that tournament um, is extraordinary, but it's also an extraordinary event to watch. And it starts off a little slow, but believe me, if when you're sitting in the audience, by the end you're standing up because it's so fascinating to watch and you're just rooting these kids on because they support each other, they cheer for each other, they encourage each other, and they work together. 
as they, and, and uh, go ahead any time and, uh, and demonstrate what you do there. <clears throat> so each of these obstacles is worth a, a, a point. So there's actually four teams that are in a um, 12 foot by 12 foot field. And so you're on either the red alliance or a blue alliance, and I'm, I'm simplifying somewhat, but you get a point for each of these. The uh, black object is a, is a negation object. So if you see that your opponent has built up a lot of points, you plop the black barrel into their bin and then you negate all of their points. Uh, there's also a doubler where um, if you yourself have, have racked up a lot of points, you can put your doubler in the bin. So there is a lot of strategy uh, in this as well and it is very exciting to watch. Here again, it's another uh, example, I think, where the theory meets the real world. So you have your best plan, you have your best design. Um, all these guys worked uh, a couple days a week, um, some Saturdays as well. We have a group of uh, great volunteers from the community and an engineer that comes in as well. And uh, things go wrong in these competitions as well. So both these teams are also um, working towards fundraising options to see that they can go on to the next level of competition. Wow, that's and is, is it going to get all negated? Is the question. But that. Making a soccer degree. Boy, I think when I said that's worth 100,000 words, I think I underestimated that because that's really a great demonstration. So we'll probably call that, um, well, why not? We'll take one more minute here and uh, I'll fill in some of the background as well. Um, so Eric Jensen, one of our community volunteers, is, is here as well. And as I said before, we have uh, uh, two others. One's a working engineer that comes in and works with the students. So we'll drop uh, three more in there and then call it good. And go for one more if you can. Uh, all right. Great. Thank you, guys. I'm going to seek in a, little le uh, a minute towards Legos here as well. So. If I could just take another uh, two minutes and, and talk about what happens before this as well. I mean, it's great that this is a middle school. This is grades 7 through 12. And, you know, I see it every day, and I think you get a sense of the continuum there of, and the skill development, grades 7 through 12. But it really can begin uh, before that as well. So uh, we have some grades 5th and 6th programs. And I think that a lot of the underpinnings of the mechanics can begin, you know, right with building structures like this. And some of those robots are just VEX versions of the Legos here. And then if you step back a little bit, uh, here's something that I think an elementary school could be done. And this is one of my favorites because basically this four bar linkage, as we talk about mechanically, it's a parallelogram in motion. And so we can study the fact that we've got this quadrilateral with opposite sides congruent, creates a parallelogram. But what that does in the robotics world is it keeps this arm perfectly perpendicular to the floor, which might be very useful if you're picking up, say, a bucket of water or something like that. You'd much rather pick it up parallel versus versus dumping it out. But this is a parallelogram in motion. I love this one. But this can start in elementary school. And then it goes here, and then it goes here. So uh, it truly is a, in my mind, it's a K-12 continuum of skills. But you got to see these guys tonight, and I appreciate your having us in for a few minutes. Can I just make one other comment? Mr. Thayer has also recently received a CIF grant. 
correct, do you want to mention that? Because I noticed that Leah was our lone female representative here this evening, and um, robots are not just for boys. <laughs> yes, thank you. And I would agree with that. Um, and so through a CEIF grant and working with PCPA, um, the next step is try to, to actively um, uh, pursue getting more girls involved in, in, in robotics. So we have a, a board game that's been developed. And I, the idea there is at the earliest of grades, I think um, enthusiastic and inspired parents even can work with their young kids at home to build things like this. I get emails from parents that enjoy working with their kids building these things. And I think, you know, even at that level, you create an enthusiasm and an interest. There is some, there is a girls only component to this. And in my experience, I'm seeing that, and this is a broad brush stroke, but I think girls can develop but perhaps a little differently than boys and that girls only environment might help in the confidence of some of the early skills. And then when you bring the two groups together, boys and girls, at that sixth grade level, then everyone can contribute to the team to build something in a, in a team atmosphere. Um, so we're just starting that process right now, but I, I, think, we'll, I think we'll make good progress on that. Very Thank you for your time. Any questions or um, comments? Thank you, Evan, thank you. for all of your work. And thank you to the kids and the parents who support them. Um, this was fascinating, really interesting. And now I want to go to a meet. But I don't know. Do you guys need chaperones in Anaheim? <laughs> <laughs> Volunteer earlier. <laughs> California. <laughs> oh, um, Can we make some noise while we're um, Sure. Should we um, take a quick break so you can? Yes. How much noise? It's loud. Yeah. We better take a quick. Um, how long will it take? Um, well, I was amazed at what they did there. So, about five minutes or less. Five minutes. Okay. Let's take. Um, let's take a, a five-minute recess then.
I'd like to call the meeting back to order, please. Thank you very much. Um, our robotics team has moved their um, equipment out, and we are ready to proceed with the rest of our meeting. Um, item number seven, um, we've moved on to communications, and we will hear from Chelsea Wynott, a high school student who um, is on the State Board of Education. Hello, Chelsea. Hi. How are you? Thank you for joining us and telling us a little bit about um, your role and um, how you were chosen. And um, I appreciate you taking the evening. And Chelsea was also a key player in mock trial. Yes. Um, again, um, my name is Chelsea Wynott. I'm a junior. Um, I am on the State Board of Education. I was telling Ms. Townsend about it the other day, and she thought it would just be an interesting thing for me to share with you. So um, it's my story. Um, when I was a sophomore, I think in like November maybe of my sophomore year, um, Ms. LaPointe, the guidance counselor at the high school, um, gave me an application to be a student member on the Maine State Board of Education. And every year a new student member is picked, so you, you're picked and you start your junior year and then you do a two-year term. And so they pick one from each district and they trade off each year. So she gave me the application and she said, I don't expect you to fill this out. Like, you don't have to. I just wanted to give it to you. And I got home and I was looking through it and I realized why she didn't expect me to fill it out. Um, it was, like, long and it was very intense. There was essays and um, recommendations. Mr. Shedd had to sign something. Mrs. Snell had to sign something. And so I, I did it anyways, and I handed it in, and then in early January, a couple months later, I heard back that I was one of six finalists, that they wanted me to come to Augusta for an interview. So I got all dressed up in my mock trial suit and everything, and I, <laughs> and I went up there with my dad, and I, I'm... I have to tell you this, this isn't really related, but when I got there, <laughs> I, um, I, w I walked up to the place, and I, I really thought that this interview was just going to be between me and this girl who had been emailing me about it, just us two. And I walk up, and there's this girl sitting in the waiting room with her mom, who was waiting to go into her interview. She got called in, and she was in there for like 25, 30 minutes, and she comes out. And she was hysterically crying. And I'm just like, oh, God. <laughs> you have got to be kidding me. So um, I waited. I'm, I'm now getting really nervous. And I get in there. And it's like this U-shape table of all the board members and then one desk in the middle for me. So I'm like, oh, God. So I sit down. And they ask me pretty hard questions, you know, what I thought about how education could help um, combat child obesity and um, education policies that I have a problem with and discuss a po possible solution and things like that. And then they gave me this sheet of paper that like had all the requirements to be a good board member and asked me to choose the one that I would have the most trouble with and what I would do to try and um, <laughs> be better. So um, I went through that whole interview and I went home and I looked a couple months later, I get a call, and they say, you're one of two. This is the last thing. We have two people left. Can you come to an interview with the governor? And so, <laughs> sure. So, um, <laughs> a couple of weeks later, you know, I'm preparing all the stuff. I'm on Google trying to figure out what kind of thing he might ask me. So, um, I get this call, and they're just like, um, the governor, I'm calling on behalf of Governor LePage, and he says that, you know, he, he wanted me to call and let you know that he reviewed your resume, doesn't see a need for an interview, and wanted me to congratulate you as the newest member of our Board of Education. 
So I was excited. I, I mean, it still wasn't over. I had to be sworn in. I had to be confirmed by the education committee. And it was around, um, I think I went to my first meeting in June. And I went to, in July, I went to, we had a retreat at the Harris Eakin Inn in Freeport, which was like two days of like meetings from <laughs> 8 o'clock in the morning until, I'm not kidding you, 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> Welcome to the real world. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. So, um, yeah, so now I'm just, um, in the fall, we spent fall traveling to schools. We went to Presque Isle, which is five hours away, and we went um, to a couple other schools and to just see, kind of check in. One school that we funded, um, like an entire new elementary school, we went there and they had their band play for us and all this. It was cute. So um, now we're just back to our regular meetings and we're working on like um, Common Core. Um, standardized, you, you know, the new SAT test that's coming out in like 2014. We'll hear a lot about that, hear a lot about charter schools, and so they're always asking me things that are going on in my town, and if there's anything I'd like to bring up, I usually don't have too much to talk about, so um, if there's ever anything that you'd like me to bring to the board, I would be more than happy to do so. They're always Seriously, always looking for me to say something. So. <laughs> Chelsea, um, how yes. we want more money? <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I can sneak that in. Tomorrow. My actual me meeting's tomorrow. We have one meeting a month, so. Let's see if I can uh, just get that. <laughs> you won't get anywhere. <laughs> you won't. Yeah, okay. so, yeah. Um, that's, that's it. That's great. That is wonderful, Chelsea. Um, any comments or questions for Chelsea? Um, it's amazing. Thank you. We have, I mean, one of two students to represent. I mean, she's the only student in our district mm -hmm. um, chosen to represent um, students, and it's a huge, huge honor. And uh, I can't think of a better person to do it than you. I have to say, when we brought Meredith in to do the tour, um, we asked Jeff for a heavy hitter student to show her around, and he chose Chelsea. <laughs> and she wasn't feeling well, but still, she was absolutely um, on her worst day better than I would be on my best day. So, um, she took me backstage at the theater, I just want to point out, which won my heart. I know. Oh, yes. So I remember that. So, uh, so um, what an honor. And I would be happy to meet with you and talk with you at any okay. point about um, the work you're doing. And if anyone um, would like to, you know, speak with Chelsea um, about um, upcoming issues, we'd love, to, we'd love to send those up to the Education Commission with you. That would be great. So thank you. And thanks thank for you. taking this evening to oh. come and present to us. Thank you. Thank you. OK. We have some Pond Cove staff here to talk about the Daily Five literacy work that they've been doing. And we thank them because we know they're 12 hours into their day, mm -hmm. and then some at this point. So <laughs> thank you for being patient. And if you could introduce yourselves, that would be... Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you very much for allowing us to come this evening and speak with all of you. Um, I'm Heather Geike. I teach fourth grade. Julie Nickerson, first grade. Karen Abbott, first grade. Amy Karen, first grade. And we're just going to set up a little uh, slideshow here for you. Um, we're very excited to talk about the Daily Five in the cafe with you this evening. How it all started was um, actually through my eight-year-old son here with me this evening. Uh, he was in a first, second grade multi-age program in Wells. And I was teaching at the school at the time, and I went in and observed this teacher, actually both of his teachers. And they were um, using the Daily Five in their classroom. And I was so impressed with what I saw. It really fosters a lot of independence amongst the students. And it allows the teacher to work independently with their students. So um, I am new to Pond Cove last year, and I implemented the program in my classroom and was asked to share the Daily Five and CAFE strategies with the different teams. So I put together a PowerPoint and um, presented to the teams, kind of from what I was told, kind of wet the appetite. 
and um, a majority of the, of the teachers in the school are now using the program. So we're very excited about that. Um, we had 12 teachers attend a conference last summer, six of which were paid by a CEF grant, and the other six, six through the district. And, um, did you want to share? No, that's me. <laughs> um, so we were lucky enough to be part of those 12 that went to Massachusetts on a hot, sticky summer day to go and um, listen to the two sisters who had developed the framework. And they call themselves the two sisters. They are sisters. They live in Seattle, right? Yes. I think. Yeah. Um, and the nice thing about learning from them is that they are actually still working with children. They're in the classroom, even though they've got this big publicized framework and um, system <laughs> that they've developed. and it's. Um, they're still very current and they have keep an, a website up to date so we're constantly getting um, new ideas that have been tweaked and, and ways that we can tweak it in our classrooms to make it suit us even better. Um, we came back inspired and energized um, from the conference. I think we were kind of beep, 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 all the way home of how we were going to make this work in our classrooms. So the framework gives us more flexibility in our teaching of literacy in our classrooms and previously with the structure of guided reading, we felt like we were under pressure to kind of get through a certain number of groups in the day, and, and we were just kind of treadmilling through. And this allows us to meet with individuals, with pairs, with groups, and be really flexible with, it might be a low reader with a high reader, but we're really focusing on the skills based on what the need is, using our assessments that we've um, new, have newly been developed and, and the observations that we're looking at on a daily basis. Um, which is also allowing us to catch concerns much sooner too, because we're really um, able to connect with individuals. Um, and the structure of the Daily Five means that we can spend more focused time instructing and less time kind of managing behaviors, you know, sit down, do this, you should be doing that, why are you doing that? When we're really now, it's, it's we're crazy proud, Amy's, Amy's phrase at the end, sorry, but we're crazy proud of how we're this really proud. looks in our classrooms. <laughs> And, um, and children are independent and working purposefully for extended periods of time. And we're working at the first grade level, and I'm amazed at how quickly children are reading and engaged and enjoying their learning. Um, they have more ownership. The goals are clear. The children know what um, they're working on, and they have a power of choice within their day. Although it's a controlled choice, it's still choice as far as they're concerned. Um, and so the Daily Five has been a framework that has built independence so that we can really teach individuals and in small groups. And what the Daily Five consists of is that there are five tasks that the students can choose to do during the literacy block. Um, please. Do we have, um, I, hopefully you'll be able to see this, but if we need to turn off lights. <coughs> we should so Hopefully it's not too loud.
And what I love about that slideshow is that really, even though there were just pictures of what the students were doing, any time that you would walk into a classroom during the literacy block, they would all be working. They would all be on task. And what's great about this is that they choose the task that they work on. So the five choices are read to self, read to someone, word work, work on writing, or listen. And um, the students take an active role in their learning. And this also, we spend a lot of time at the beginning of the year setting up expectations for each of the tasks. What are the expectations of the student? And the teacher is always working with students during this time. Um, so like Julie said, just to piggyback off that, that there's not a lot of behavior management going on. You've already set your expectations and the students know and they follow those. So this is really the skeleton or the framework of the, um, the program. Okay. okay. There it goes. <laughs> All right. So, um, once we had that daily five structure up and running, um, the children were able to work independently. We could turn our focus to what we call the cafe menu, or the bulletin board that we've created in our classrooms around um, the reading strategies that we are instructing the children on. And what you're going to see, um, there are four components to it. Comprehension, which is understanding what I read. There's accuracy, which is I can read the words. Fluency, you make it sound like a storyteller, the way the author wanted you to read his book or her book, and understanding what you read. And then expanding your vocabulary in order to be a better reader and writer, you want to find those new and interesting words and use those, learn them, understand what they mean, put them in your writing, carry them across. Um, Daily Five will teach independence, but the cafe provides a structure for um, how teachers confer with children. So the first one, this is an example. We have the four topics across the top. And underneath, <laughs> the, are, that's sort of the menu. And then underneath are the um, pieces of reading that meet the standards that we're supposed to be teaching. So those are the pieces that we will um, teach the children. And it also provides a common language around their reading development. We can say to them, uh, what's your goal? What's your goal? Your goal is accuracy. What part of accuracy are you learning? Right now, you need to flip the sound on vowels. That's your goal. I want to see what you're doing in your book right now. Um, show me where you're using that strategy. And it also provides a system for teachers to track progress and foster the independence of these children when they're doing their, their reading. Um, it begins as soon as the children have developed what we call stamina in our classroom. And if you don't, if you think a first grader doesn't understand, I'm sure your fourth grade class as well, doesn't understand what that word stamina is, ask them. It's great. <laughs> um, and every day we'll say, all we have to do is say, how's your stamina doing? Are you able to uh, you know, work for quite a bit? And they, are, they know that in order to be better readers and writers, they need to build their stamina. Um, it's very hard for a teacher in the beginning when we first bring and open up the wall. We start with one, check for understanding, or cross-checking, those are usually the first things we teach them. And we're supposed to be staying away from them completely the first couple of weeks that we start the Daily Five in the cafe. And that's extremely hard. They're building their stamina, but we're building ours. Because if I go, if I step in every time they need help, or every time they're off task, that's not fostering their independence. So we need to stay away so that they can do that and become independent later on. Um, reading instruction. Again, planned around our assessments, and it's based on individual needs. Um, small groups are formed based on these needs, and we may decide that an individual needs more help one-on-one. -on -one. So we may do a lot of one-on-one -on -one with children as well as small groups. Um, once they're able to maintain their stamina over 10 minutes, 15 minutes, that's when we start this small group instruction. That's when we know, OK, it's time. We can do this now, and so can you. Um, lessons. Um, that we model, like the check for understanding, these become their goals. And down at the bottom, you can see there are several stars. And each one of those stars has a child's name on it. And that star will belong under whatever part of the menu they're working on. Wherever their strategy is, their star goes. It is uh, not a progressive menu. You don't start on the left and work your way up to the right. It's flexible. A child may start out in accuracy, but based on assessments, the things that we're seeing with the ch child, 
they may move into comprehension and be working on a skill there. So their stars and, or their pictures are moving all the time. Um, and then this becomes our anchor. And these are some other examples in other classrooms around our school. And you can see that they're all different, a lot of them. This is in Mrs. Geike's room, correct? Yes. I love this one. Love the frames. Uh, this is a great one. Um, one of the things that starts out is as we introduce these strategies, we write the cards, the strategy cards, and then gradually we release that to them. They write the card. We choose a certain student. They write the, tar, um, the card. Sometimes they write their name on the card to show they're the, what would you call it, Amy? When they have the vest on. Oh, that's the IT department. Well, I know, but you have a great <laughs> word for it, and I love it. But it's like they're the teacher. Remember what it is? Okay, I'll keep thinking. Sorry. Okay, you keep thinking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> kind of the spot. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, they they also can decorate them, and so that they. So this is one of the teachers. Yeah, I'm expert. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Um, this is one that a teacher did, but as, again, the visuals really help the child. They may not be able to read the words, but boy, they can read those pictures. And they draw their own pictures to help them understand what that goal is. Here's a great one. I love these. I don't know if you can see them all, but you can tell that this is definitely child-centered. There's the names all around the one down. I think they're doing a lot of questions while reading. A lot of the kids are working on that skill. Oh, and I love the one in the middle here. Use beginning and ending sounds. You see the owl and the elephant? And the little pig? Is that what was elephant? cool is that they, a lot of times before we had even introduced a, a strategy, like on this, this one was from my classroom, and before we'd even introduced, like, use the picture as a strategy, one of the kids who I'd say, how'd you figure out that word? And they'd say, well, I looked at the picture, and I'd be like, you are in charge of writing this card, and make sure you put that little mouse on there so that everyone remembers, like, how you came up with that is that little mouse. So that's why there's a little mouse on his picture. So that's Nate's skill. If you're trying to figure out an unknown word, you might be able to, to use Nate's strategy. Mm -hmm. so. Up close. Cross-checking is something we teach them right in the beginning. It's extremely important. It ties right into guided reading that we do. Does it look right? Does it sound right? And then does it make sense? So that you can see them sometimes. Some children will actually use that manipulative, just moving their bodies to remember what the skill is. Here's another one. I love that one, too. Know the words by heart. He's got quite a few, or she. Here's another, just some other examples. Okay. So um, I'm the closer of the group tonight, and I actually just wanted to start by saying when we got an email that asked if we were any of any of the Pond Cove teachers were interested in talking about the Daily Five, the four of us were like, because <laughs> because it's just been a very very exciting. It, it, process it's it's thrilling and it's it's changed everything we think it's even changed sort of the the social climate at Pond Cove because it because it's such an explicit way of teaching and we, what was very important to us when we heard about this and we started learning this summer was that it wasn't a brand new curriculum because we, we we feel really solid about our curriculum we've improved it over the years and stuff like that and you know as soon as we heard Daily Five we were like what new stuff now like I just perfected all the other stuff and um but to find out that it was more of a framework for the great curriculum we already have and, and I, a, a way to get the kids to be independent and a way to, as Julie said, not micromanage the classroom as they're working on their reading. And we, we, it sets the kids up to do really authentic reading and writing independently, not just busy work, but they're, they're doing authentic things by themselves so that we can work one-on-one -on -one with a student if we we found out that they need help on rhyming. We may even have a small group on rhyming. I mean, it can even tell me, like the assessments can tell me that most of my class knows how to rhyme so that I don't have to do a whole class lesson on rhyming. I have three kids that I need to pull over and meet with about rhyming. So, um, and, okay, all right, we're gonna try to focus here so we can finish up, <laughs> sorry. Um, 
So let's see. We love it because of that one-on-one -on -one conferencing. We love it because it changed our um, reading groups quite a bit from from being a group of kids all at the same reading level to being a group of kids at mixed ability levels working on the same strategy. So you, in turn, you could have like a child reading a level four, and you could have a child reading a level 20 meeting in the same reading group because they're all working on maybe stretch and blend, or putting words back together, or using a chunk, which I'm sorry about the chunk thing, but um, <laughs> it, so it, you know, we could mix it. We call it, I'm not even sure how to say it, but we, it's, it's either hetero, heterogeneous or heterogeneous grouping. So it's, that was kind of exciting because the kids can't really figure out who's in what reading group. You know what I mean? Like they haven't really figured out which one's the high group and which, because there is no high group, that sort of thing. So um, it has just changed all of our conversations at Pond Cove School. It's changed, what's funny is it's changed the teacher conversations, but it's also changed the kid conversations. And they, the way that they talk now is like little grown-ups. You know, they just can speak exactly the way that we taught, you know, exactly the strategy, like, oh, I was using the chunking strategy, and so, you know, and it, it, it's just, we were crazy proud of it, like we said, and we were hoping um, to extend an invitation for you guys to come over anytime and see it, because it's actually almost a full day of literacy, um, so that any time to stop by and see, Meredith came by my classroom, and, uh, Got to see some. <laughs> got I to see some really with, fun. I got to be read too. I was yeah, reading. yeah. So it's pretty. We would love to have you come over and take a look at it because we love it. But not so. until after vacation, we'd appreciate. It. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. We're just very, very excited. About it. One, last one last one. One last one. Oh yeah. Sorry. We have sorry. a little have one more. We wanted this to ask there. the kids what they thought about the Daily Five. So this last part is starring the children. What I like about the cafe menu is that whenever we're like reading with a buddy or just reading by yourself and you feel like you stumbled on something, you can look up at the menu and you can say like, oh, I remembered I have to read with expression or something and to make it sound more fluent like you're actually reading to someone. My favorite is read to someone because I get to read to my friends. My favorite is writing because you get to write over and over again. My favorite is listening because if you don't know how to read a book, you can still listen to it and enjoy it. Um, I probably like uh, writing at Daily Five because it just gives me a chance to just write a really fun story and it, gives, it lets me be creative. Writing. And you can write is stories that you have done. My favorite is word work because you make words and you can be like a better um, writer. My favorite is read to someone because you can read to your friends. My favorite is writing because you get to write really cool things that happened to you before. What I like about Daily Five is you can pick a lot of stuff instead of like, you have to do this, you have to do that. That's what I like. <laughs> so we'd, uh, we'd love to come back then. Oh, 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 I was also supposed to mention um, that, that uh, as well as C funding um, half of the t uh, six out of the 12 teachers to go do the summer conference, C also funded, as, as you saw, Listen to Reading, I wanted to give them a shout out because they funded um, iPods for the classroom for books on tape for the kids. So that's, that we tried to put that in there and show that because that's ch again, changed everything. So that's cool. That's um, any comments or questions for our team? I just want to thank you all for coming in. Um, we talked a lot on the school board about the, the literacy goal in the, in the district. And um, it's, that, that talk at the board level can be rather dry. Um, and it's wonderful to see um, the, your enthusiasm and to see you know, this, this view into the work that you're doing in the classroom and, and, and you know, to, for us to have a little chance to experience the classroom is really, is really wonderful. So thank you. Anyone else? 
Shall we call first or Meredith doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> she stays for a while. <laughs> call me and I'll <laughs> we'll get a call from Meredith. We can show up. <laughs> I know. Well thank you so much. It's, it's I know really this. I mean you really I uh, oftentimes I'm closest to Tom's office, which in a way, you know, has been good and bad. Um, but <laughs> It's, it, you know, I just, I often hop down there and I'm like, you have to come see this. It's insane. What is, it's like, I feel like I'm teaching at like 12th grade because they're so independent and they're all busy and I don't even want to interrupt them. They're so busy. You know, but, That's so. great. Well, I just wanted to say something else too. And the, all the work we've done with Tammy and Claire kind of works, just flows really well into yeah. this. And we've been totally energized by the, the work that they've come in. I don't know if you've had it any chance to be no, with them, but they like come in with this great hurricane of idea and we're like sucking it up and one more all the time and it, they were able to model lessons within this framework and, and show us how all of that work with them ties into all of this too. So it's all and that was also a C parent I think too, the Tammy and Claire. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, see. So you're one lucky group. <laughs> yes. Now, well, thank you so much for putting this together and coming and speaking with us tonight. I, it was a great presentation. I can't say any more than John said. So thank you very much. Okay, so um, under communications, we have item C, athletics department. Yes. Yes. Right. I believe in your packet uh, there was a participation um, spreadsheet and um, an athletic injury spreadsheet in there. Um, so it's pretty self-explanatory, but I'll keep it. I'll keep it brief. Athletic numbers uh, this fall, both in the high school and middle school, uh, were right on par. Um, pretty much with where they were last year, down slightly, um, about 20 students in the uh, high school uh, from this fall to last fall. Um, middle school is right on par. And um, so that's, that's uh, good news, I think, in this, in this economy and given participation fees and what's happening na nationwide, um, that number is decreasing. So to see ours being, uh, staying steady um, is really uh, reassuring. So glad to see that. Now, I've done this uh, each after each season. I'll provide um, a spreadsheet report for uh, after each season with all the numbers. Um, on the athletic injuries, I think it's been, first I'd like to thank the uh, school board for all of their support. Um, for the athletic trainer position. And, um, I think it's a true benefit to our, our student athletes, our athletic program, having uh, that person that can assess, be the, basically the first responder when there's an injury. Um, and Lisa does a tremendous job. She's built an incredible relationship with the students. Um, and she's not only uh, assessing and managing, she's rehabilitating, she's educating, um, she's doing some strength and conditioning type stuff with our students and our teams. So um, really fortunate and very thankful to uh, have that support for an athletic trainer. And basically some of the totals there, treatment totals, that could be, so when you look at upper extremities, lower extremities, those numbers, if you add them all up and then you look at your treatment totals, you're like, well, that doesn't, that doesn't add up. But treatment totals would be everything from um, doing some rehab. Whenever a student comes into her office, she documents that information. So that's why that number looks a little different. And it could be something like a blister um, as well. So that was, that's two of the reports that I had put in there. And um, one thing I would like to do, we would like to say is uh, on behalf of the students, um, thank, there are a few people that I would like to thank. There are 350 athletic events in the fall. And um, at some point, uh, there's a town service or uh, a school program or a resident of this community or business that uh, has an impact on our students. And it could be anything from public works to our fire and rescue and our police department 
the, the work that they do with community services, uh, the facilities and maintenance people, our faculty and staff, our administration, the coaching staff, our athletic boosters, our parents, our local businesses, uh, the citizens and residents of the community. I mean, it is a community event. Athletics um, in this town, I think that's what separates uh, our athletic program from a lot of, a lot of other um, athletic programs is that community support and, and um, it's, uh, it makes, for, makes my job a lot easier and we're very grateful. I know the students are very grateful for that. Um, it's a really, really nice thing. I had a couple questions, Jeff. Uh, first of all, I, don't, I want to compliment you on the great job that you do. I don't know how many people go to athletic events. I go to a lot. Um, I'm also at the school sometimes early, sometimes late. I've never been there before Jeff has been there. I never left, and I didn't see his truck in the parking lot, yeah. especially on weekends. I don't know how you, you do all that you do, Jeff. I think you do too much, but God bless you. Uh, this, this athletic program would not exist without Jeff Correct. He does everything. You're going to see him on a Saturday or a Sunday or a Friday or whatever. It's absolutely amazing. So I do want to thank you, Jeff, for the job that you do. I, I know a lot about it. I see it, and I'm constantly amazed. Your, your wife probably doesn't know your first name anymore now. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. I probably should have added my wife to that list. <laughs> <laughs> I thank her every time I, I see her. I probably should have put her at the I top. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I did notice something in the numbers of injuries, and it may have to do with the fact that um, uh, it seems in the last three years, the number of treatment totals has gone up dramatically in the fall, and it also seems that the number of concussions has gone up dramatically in the last, since 08, 09 to present. And I'm just noticing those trends in your numbers. I think on the uh, treatment totals, one of the pieces that has been, we've tried to uh, increase the athletic trainer's hours, and um, last budget season there was a, a significant increase. And, and so to where that actually went full time, and, and therefore there's more? I think um, her total hours now are um, basically a reflective of the time that she's been putting in um, and, and the, the funding for that position. Um, but on the concussion side, I think a lot has to do with the education and the steps that the, the school board and, the, and uh, the administration and the school nurse, athletic trainers put in to uh, provide awareness and uh, a protocol for um, treating concussions. In other words, it isn't that, it's almost like, um, I can give a good uh, example, but it's, it's uh, they've always been there just that we're catching them more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that 100%. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Um, item D, special education staffing. Um, yeah, Jane, are you going to be addressing? We have um, Jane Golding, who is the Director of Instructional Support Services here in Cape Elizabeth. Good evening. Um, you all received a memo, and so I'm really here just to answer your questions. Um, yeah, do you mind giving a brief overview, overview? Of, okay. of your plan? Um, during the school year, we've had three educational technicians resign two have achieved teaching jobs in other districts, for, so we're very proud of them, and one moved out of state. We've left those positions open and looked again at how we are staffing um, each school and have done some shifting around and so continue to have those three positions open. And we'd like to roll that three position money into a teacher position um, for the remainder of the school year. That person would serve kindergarten through sixth grade, specifically focusing on literacy instruction for young people with special education needs, as well as being able to do some interventions in classrooms for young people who may be in the pre-referral stage. Thank you, Thank you Jane. Um, questions? John, did you? Yeah, um, I just have one. Um, uh, I think Meredith explained to me in the planning session um, how this 
how the how the teacher the single teacher would be able to provide the services that are now being provided by three ed techs but i'd love it if you explained it again um maybe i would understand sure. better recall it or or maybe i would um for, and i think it's worth um, the public understanding i would like to understand i think it's worthwhile for the public to understand as well so actually, there was one ed tech position at each school that was vacated. So we looked, we began by looking at the elementary school and the positioning of our educational technicians and the children they were serving, and realized that with some adjustment, we could continue to serve the children very well um, and didn't fill the position. We then looked at the middle school position, which had been vacant since the day before school, looked again at the young people, and the students were actually doing really well and didn't need as much support as we had anticipated, so we didn't fill the position. The high school position was vacated again the day before school started, and we filled that with a sub for quite some time. What we've been able to do is to look at our educational technicians at the middle school, make some adjustments in assignments, and move one person from the middle school to the high school to fill that position. Those young people at the high school did indeed need that continued service um, of an educational technician. At this point, we feel like we really need the services of an educator, a teacher, who is certified who can work beside and with classroom teachers and directly serve young people in teaching. So that's so a, how a we've moved up. things around. We, we won't have any students then who are receiving services n now who, who won't be able to receive services because we're, because we're reducing the number of, the total number of positions. No. Because everyone is served. Aren't filled. This has taken months. This has taken actually since before school started. Um, for us to be sure that everyone is served. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, David. I, I, again, I, I, it's hard to follow, maybe it's time of night or whatever, the memo. So I want to make sure I understand your oral explanation. Mm -hmm. We lost three ed techs, one at each school. Correct. We uh, replaced them with a teacher at one school, which is the primary, uh, excuse me, elementary school. Um, middle school is taken care of because we didn't need, it turns out we didn't need as many ed techs as we thought we did. Correct. And we're actually shifting one of those ed techs to the high school to fill the high school's need. Yes. So that's, so the net effect is, um, um, what, okay. Then you have the additional comment at the end. Um, which I do understand the first three bullet points, the last bullet point, I understand the elimination of, a, of the private tutor is not a sp certified special educator. So is there, a, in addition to this, we're eliminating another position? Well, there was a carryover from last year. A private tutor was hired to work one-to-one -one with some students in the elementary school, and that contracted service has been continued this year as school started. However, this person is serving young people who have IEPs, and she is not a certified special educator. So my goal is that children with IEPs are served by certified special educators. So continuing my summary, we have three ed techs that are gone. We're shifting one from the middle school to the high school. We don't have, and that's available because of lack of need middle school. We're eliminating a private tutor at, um, apparently it was primarily at Punk Cove. She currently is serving two or three young people at the middle school, is ready to dismiss them because they've done so well. So that just leaves us with a couple at the elementary school. And this special educator would indeed be able to serve those young people. Okay. That's Almost a contracted got service. It's not an employee of ours, the tutor. I, okay, I'm, I'm just trying to follow the ads and subtracts here. Um, Do you have a specific question, David? Well, yes. I, I will, she's answering it as I'm asking it. Well, she didn't mention the elimination of a special tutor. Now, since I see it on there, she's now explaining it. Because so the numbers weren't adding up. Elimination of three, adding of one doesn't add up. 
So now I'm finding out how it adds up. Okay? Oh, yeah, sure. All right. Um, I think I've now got it all to add up. Okay. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. We'll relook at how to serve them best. We actually have an amazing um, program in place for one of them right now. One of the middle school special educators has done a great job in putting together um, materials and a support system for this particular student. Um, and the tutor actually was quite amazed at what she saw. So I think we'll be fine. And Absolutely. And the reality is that we will depend on who we are able to hire. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. So we don't we remove to... services before we have what we need. Exactly. Yeah, so we're looking for the specific yeah. certification skills. Or those, uh, we're looking for someone to be able to serve those young people as well as they are being served currently. One more question. Um, I meant to summarize by I did actually have a question as well as directions. Is what's there's a lot of people moving around. I didn't ask about the substitute. I assume uh, I think you said there was a substitute covering in the high school. There was. Will there still be after the hiring of this person? No, the substitute has left. Okay. Um, what's the net effect of all this on our budget by adding this person, eliminating these positions, shifting? Is the net effect a positive, negative, or neutral? Well, it will depend on the level of teacher we hire, but three educational technicians' salaries are very comfortable to hire a teacher. Okay. So you're confident that we're, we're not going to, you, you're comfortable, I'll put it this way, that we should not see uh, an unexpected demand on our budget? Not with this, no. I'm vigilant of the budget, have been since I arrived. Well, that's nice to know. <laughs> I would just add that special education staffing is something we'll be talking about at the January workshop. So certainly if you have other questions that you don't have answered tonight, please, we'll, we'll ask for that input prior to the, or Michael will likely be asking for that input as the new finance chair prior to the January workshop meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for waiting. Not to worry. Thank you. Um, Moving on now to the superintendent's report. There it is. Are we violate any labor laws by those kind of employees we have out there? I asked if they would mind. Okay. So I, I, I have to say, I don't know what, what you're doing or what you're driving with. They're unbelievably well behaved. You missed the compliment. I think they're modeling for us, David. They what? They're what? For us, David, or for David? You missed it. <laughs> so. <laughs> I've just handed out, um, hopefully, a somewhat visual representation of the vision and 
the process of updating the vision, mission, and values of the Cape Elizabeth School District. And it's been several years since the district has gone back to look at those. Um, during the interview process and during my sort of entry into the dis district um, during the last several months, it's a theme that has come up a lot. Um, uh, it, it seems to be a, a juncture at which this would be a useful exercise. So I have um, just kind of laid out a little bit of a visual framework, and I'm sorry because I left my computer upstairs and thought I could plug in my laptop, but the graphic didn't translate, so I'm just going to talk about it. Um, but basically, it, um, this graphic, which we'll post on the website, includes sort of the definition of what a, vi what, what a vision is, which is basically what, is, what would success look like. Um, the mission, which is the district's role and responsibility for achieving that vision. And what are the values, the beliefs that we have a district have um, and ha that, that will help us translate into best practice. And so this process um, will kind of unfold in the coming months. Um, and we'll be seeking input from a wide range of stakeholders. So um, the way I've kind of mapped this is that we kind of start with our current vision, mission, and values. And we'll be asking the leadership team, the teachers and district staff to weigh in on those, take them through some exercises to look at that, and think about where do we want to be. We'll use that information to inform the process with the wider community. So to have the conversations with students, with parents, with citizens of Cape Elizabeth, with business owners, with um, town representatives. <coughs> Let's hear where they want to be, as informed by the process that has taken place with staff. Feed that back to the district staff, the teachers, and the leadership team to create a renewed um, vision, mission, and values, which will then be presented to the school board for adoption. So it's a rather simplistic representat representation, um, but I think it's the best way to sort of illustrate the work that lies before us. Um, again, I anticipate this process kind of unfolding. It actually, some of that work will start tomorrow. Some of it will continue into next week with some conversation with our faculty K-12. Um, and I anticipate this being kind of finalized in time for the March business meeting. With any luck, it will happen a little earlier than that, but it is winter in New England, <laughs> even though you wouldn't know that to have stepped outside today. Um, you know, I put a little side note that there's really no budget <laughs> for this project, which is fine. Um, you know, I kind of knew this, this work was out there, um, but I will be seeking volunteer support to kind of augment the district's resources. So if you have expertise in publicity or public relations or don't mind making phone calls to gather some donations for expenses like refreshments, if you have expertise in compiling data and doing data entry or wordsmithing and editing, please contact the superintendent's office and, um, you know, it, I will be happy to have a conversation with you and see how we can put your skills and talents to work. Um, but this is really an exciting opportunity for the district. I think it's an important time for us to think about who we are as a K-12 district or as a pre-K to lifelong learning district as we think about our um, work with the community services department. And so it's an exciting piece for me. It's the beginning. Um, it informs the work that comes after that. It leads us into goal setting and, and um, High, laying out the timelines for some of our goals and the specific pieces that we want to measure. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that process. Questions on this piece? Because I have lots more to talk about. <laughs> I'm looking forward to Mindful of time, I'll just try to zip through the rest of this. Um, I was reminded, listening tonight to all that's going on, um, of uh, my work in a crazy, chaotic summer theater environment where the slogan was, where so much is happening, we can hardly keep track. Um, that's how it felt at this meeting tonight. Um, and I think that that's the truth about the work of a school district. There's a lot going on all the time in every classroom, in every school, in every building, in every department, and um, they're exciting places to work. Uh, in late November, we held a meeting with our new staff from across the district, so teachers who are new to the Cape Elizabeth School District, maybe they're brand new teachers, maybe they've moved from another district, or in some cases they are teachers who have changed schools or changed roles within our district. And it was just, a, again, a great K-12 opportunity for people to come together and have um, conversation about things that are going well, what, what are some surprises, how can we support you? And thanks to Steve and John, who are able to represent the administrative team there with me at that meeting. We also had a K-12 teacher leader um, meeting. 
Diamond Discuss format, and since Jeff thanked his wife, I will thank my husband for cooking lasagna um, for, for the 40 people who came out that night. Um, we had a Massachusetts principal who is um, a former colleague of Jane Goldings. Her name is Catherine Glad, and she's published a lot of work around professional learning communities. And so Catherine came um, at no cost to the district. Bless her. We thank her again. Um, and spent some time talking with our teachers and facilitating some work, walk, work walking us through the process of some protocols and professional learning community work. And we will have another of those events in February. Uh, I also held a coffee chat on November 16th, and there are a couple people here tonight who um, turned out for that meeting. There were only a handful of people who came, but we will not be deterred, and I will um, be hosting another coffee chat on um, January 21st, 2012. Let's see. Um, the middle school, recycling is a recurring theme around here, and I just want to point out that the middle school, the sixth grade, is part of a zero waste challenge by the Chwanki, Camp Chwanki is the outdoor experience that the sixth grade participates in. So their goal is to try to have no trash and to do their absolute best. So they're, but they're also, the homerooms in sixth grade are collecting some information, um, interviewing people in the district, and plan to produce some sort of final product that will help inform the rest of us about the work that we can do um, in the area of recycling and being good stewards of our resources. Uh, middle school is also in the midst of the winter fitness challenge. I have not logged in. I'm sorry, Mr. Shout, but I will take care of that soon. Um, and Chelsea Wynott was here earlier. The Maine Department of Education is also in the midst of the No Child Left Behind waiver process. So we have sent out information to our faculty asking them to participate in the survey that's posted online. Please um, help inform the process, and that's not open only to school um, district employees, but there's more information about that posted on the Maine Department of Education website. The town adopted their budget calendar last night, so we will bring forth to you at the January board meeting a draft um, calendar for budget. I'm pleased to say that the new community services brochure is available online. It has not yet been mailed out to homes, but it is coming. And registration begins New Year's Day at 8 p.m., New Year's evening, I guess, at 8 p.m. And tomorrow evening, 6.30, you can watch Mr. Connolly lead uh, the middle school faculty team in competition against uh, the Harlem. And it's not the Globe Trotters, it's a... Superstar. No, the, uh, superstars. No, superstars. 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 The Harlem Superstars, who are former Harlem Globe Trotters, who travel as a, as a group. Um, that game will take place at 6.30 tomorrow night at the high school gym. Is that all? There are a few other things on here, but I will stop. Okay. Thank you, Merida. You're right. There's a lot, a lot going on, and I'm mindful of the time as well. So we will move along to new business. Um, item A: Consideration to approve the Nordic Ski Team Trip to Sugarloaf Outdoor Center, Carabasset Valley, Maine, December 28th through 30th, 2011. Do I have a motion, please? I have a motion to approve the Nordic Ski Team trip to the Sugarloaf Outdoor Center in Carabasset Valley, Maine on December 28th through the 30th, 2011. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. okay, any discussion, questions? All those in favor? Okay. Seven zero. Um, item B, consideration to approve Cape Elizabeth's pass Part 1 budget costs for 2012-2015 in the amount of $56,002.91. Do I have a motion? Yes, I move for the approval of Cape Elizabeth Pass Part 1 budget costs for the 2012-2013 uh, budget year in the amount of $56,002.91. And do I have a second? Second. Um, discussion? Questions? I can briefly just explain that the PAS budget, PAS is the Portland Area Technical High School, and the PAS budget formula is set by um, agreement with the member districts, and that agreement calls for the tuition to be set based on the prior two years um, enrollment of students from Cape Elizabeth in the PAS program. So from last year's two-year period to this year's two-year period, um, we're looking at an increase of, it's one and a half students, which equates to about $10,000. 
questions, concerns? All right. Um, all those in favor? Okay, item C. Um, we have consideration of the following policies for second reading. Um, were you going to do the policies or I can, were you? Otherwise, I can cite the policies that <laughs> they're and available here them. for second reading. Okay. Um, we have um, we have three policies um, for second reading tonight. Are we going to go through? I guess we'll go through each one of them individually. Um, the first is JRAE, which is um, the Annual Notice of Student Education Records and Information Rights. Um, Do you want to, um, the way it's been done in the past, I think, is at times Kathy will um, present these as a slate um, for nomination or for approval. Um, she'll, she'll do a, a motion that contains all of the policies. I don't know if you want to do it that way. Sure. Or if you want to sure, do Sure, we can do it that way, then we can discuss. If, if there's any discussion, we can discuss okay. individual policies. So, so in that case, I would move to approve the following policies: JRA, JRA-E, GBE, BB, staff conduct with students, and JJIAB, uh, private school students access to public school co-curricular interscholastic and extracurricular activities. John, it, is the motion to approve these, or there's just a consideration for a second reading? And if we're not voting to approve these, it's just a... It's voting to approve. Second reading is generally considered adoption. It's approved. So it should be to adopt. Okay. I assume in that motion you have include... a second, Mary? Yes. May okay. I have a second, please? Second. Okay. Could I add to that motion the if, um, John didn't mention the variety of forms attached to JJIAB. I assume he included that he meant to include that in his motion. Thank you, David. Amendment accepted. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, any questions, concerns about these policies? David. Yeah, I, I still have a problem with the staff conduct with students, uh, one. Um, it's under prohibited contact, second bullet point. Um, I, I, made, I suggested language before. I wrote the language. It didn't get put in here. Uh, or if it did, I didn't write it very well. It says, singling out a particular student or student for personal attention and friendship beyond um, uh, the normal student excuse me, teacher-student relationship. Uh, th that just sounds awkward and wrong to me. It it's really is singling out a particular student for personal attention and friendship beyond uh, inappropriate teacher-student relationship would be better because there are certain uh, attention that's beyond the normal student-teacher. Like some student needs special attention. That's beyond what is the normal teacher-student relationship. It's just awkward language. And I think it's better handled by the word appropriate. You understand what I'm trying to say? Does everybody understand what I'm trying to say? It's when you say beyond normal, that means any kid that needs extra attention can't get it. What we're really getting at is inappropriate behavior. So it should be beyond inappropriate student. And I don't even like the words. Uh, sticking on a particular student, actually I would take out the word beyond. Singing on a particular student or students for personal, Friendship and, and personal attention and friendship um, uh, that is not uh, that is not appropriate and, and that is not an appropriate student teacher student relationship. I, I guess um, um, I'd be interested in your guidance, Meredith. But uh, to me, that the language is uh, uh, doesn't offer very good guidance. I <clears throat> I would agree with David. I think to say that. Beyond the normal is not a very good way of offering guidance as to what's appropriate and what what isn't appropriate. Um, but 
you know, uh, my experience on the policy committee began this evening. <laughs> my, and my, so my, I, think what I, would rec I, I think what I would recommend that we do right now is to, would be to withdraw this particular policy, um, bring it back to the committee and review it, and then um, bring it back to the board uh, upon that review. All right. I, I would second that. All right. So, um, so the motion is amended to approve. So the uh, yes. Well, the motion is amended to exclude. Yes. G B E B B. Okay. Second. Okay. All right. So, um, all those in favor of um, approving the policies with the exclusion of JBEBB, please raise your hand. Thank you. All right. And then um, we have policies for first reading. We have two policies um, for first reading. So those are not, we have no motion on that. We don't have to vote on those. Um, I will say I, um, I did find some errors in there that I'd like to pass on to the chair. I'll just pass them on, um, some typos. I found a lot more than typos. Um, okay. This, to be honest with you, the, the policy in the rule is almost incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. it's, it started off as one attempt and I helped with that one attempt. Then it got, this is almost an example of where too many committees get involved in uh, some sort of a multi-headed hydra. There's definitions added in at the top that don't match what's in the body. Mm -hmm. This thing really needs to be completely rewritten. Mm -hmm. um, John, um, this, this needs a lot of work. It was an attempt, I think, some of the changes that were early suggested were not made. Are you talking about the first which of these two both policies? Of both of them. Both of them. They, it's almost as if the, I, the iPad initiative committee added some revisions, and the revisions don't work because they add definitions that are not followed within the body, add words that haven't been defined in the body, and then certain changes that were made um, weren't made, and I mean, I could go on and on, but this is painful. It's okay. <laughs> it's fair. I, I, I was trying to be quick. It's fair, I think. So just to um, address that a little bit, at the time of the last policy committee meeting, which was prior to the election, prior to the appointment of new policy committee members, this policy had been drafted um, with some input from the iPad committee and vetted a little bit by Gary and Jeff, but it had not yet received, we had not yet received legal feedback on um, the draft policy. However, given the timeline of the iPad rollout, it was recommended that we move it forward, at least in a first reading, so that we could have some discussion about the policy itself. Basically, the gist is, and I appreciate that it may be inartful, um, and so we're, we're happy to um, continue working on that, but, but the intent is to have our um, student computer use policy reflect the use of devices such as iPads, um, because really the way the policy was written previously, it did not cover the use of such devices. So I, I appreciate that we have work to do. We certainly are aware of that. and. Um, at the policy committee meeting, we're, we're happy to take any of those suggestions. So at our policy committee meeting, that would be the appropriate time to talk about um, like typos and grammatical errors and that kind of thing. Also? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or I'm, get, I'm going to hand mine to, to John at this point, but uh, okay. John will set a policy meeting. Um, you know, probably in the next few weeks, he'll be in touch with policy, um, policy committee um, members and um, Meredith, you can um, address the dates that best work with your staff as well, and we'll come up with a policy meeting that will be, the, the board will be advised of that date as well. Um, just to, if I get an email of it, I'd be glad, just tonight I went through this and found a lot of things. I'd be happy, I don't really want to draft any more documents, because I, I tried this twice, and, and um, I, I will list what I think are problems without suggesting solutions in, in, by number or put in a PDF or something. Okay. 
and, and, and the draft person should understand how to draft an integrated document. That's the, one of the major problems here, it's not integrated. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. All right. Okay. E, consideration to approve the following athletic and extracurricular staff nominations. I, I think maybe just um, if we can nominate them as a slate, please. Um, do I have a motion? I move for the approval of the following athletic and extracurricular staff nominations as reflected in the uh, agenda packet for the high school and middle school. Second. I second that. Okay. Um, any discussion? Okay. All those in favor? All right. Um, item F, consideration to appoint Elizabeth Milroy and reappoint Fred Sturdivant as school representatives to the Community Services Advisory Commission. Um, terms to expire, their terms will expire December 31st, 2014. Do I have a motion, please? Um, I move to appoint Elizabeth Mulroy and reappoint Fred Sturdivant as school representatives to the Community Services Advisory Commission. Terms to expire on 12-31-2014. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Right. Um, any discussion? Questions? All those in favor? Um, then we have a couple of maternity leave um, requests. Item G, consideration to approve of leave of absence request for high school teacher Aaron Hill during the 2012-2013 school year. Do I have a motion, please? I move that we approve a leave of absence request for high school teacher Aaron Hill during the 2012-2013 school year. Right. We have a second, please. Um, any discussion? Um, maybe just one suggestion. I know, uh, um, I guess there's a standard, um, if you request a leave of absence, you know, here's the compensation impact, here's the health insurance. And, you know, I, is my, does everyone who submits this, the way that sometimes they're written, it doesn't confirm their understanding, like they may have to pay it. A certain amount. Should we, as a board, assume that they understand that? In other words, I don't want us to approve right. just a leave of absence. Just it's called a leave of absence, and a teacher says, "Well, you approved it, and it it didn't reflect that." So, is there a way, maybe when these are submitted, it would just say, "You know, I understand that." You now, here's the protocol. D does that make sense? Because if you're approving a leave of absence and it's not really specified, well, what does that entail? I'm a little concerned, you know, someone could say, well, you approved it, and someone help me I out. I the terms are specified in the teacher contract. I, I understand okay. the point, and in this particular case, the teacher contract specifies the details around um, a leave of absence. Okay. And we don't cover anything. <laughs> okay. For the record. Yeah. It may be helpful for us to know that, um, particularly new board members, mm -hmm. to have it sketched out what we do cover, um, what's covered by law, um, and uh, with contract and, and um, teachers who aren't under continuing contract. Yeah. I hate being on the end because I have to get look around this guy. Um, but I have a question. Um, it would be helpful, but we get these a lot, and it always questions come up about what's written here versus what's in the teacher contract. It would be helpful if we get this for you to note, is there, and also it's somewhat in, inconsistent what our policy is and when we grant these. I think it's, at some point we have to come up with a policy or a consistent, if it's not a policy, uh, uh, plus an understanding. But I think at the very least what we, what we should do is, so we don't have to worry about what the content of this is, for you to look at these sorts of requests and tell us, are they asking for more or less than what they're entitled to under the law or the contract? And uh, just briefly, David, what I would say is my intention is to try to do that in the agenda notes, which is where I indicated that they have been reviewed and that the principal and I support those requests. So I wouldn't endorse a request if I felt it was inappropriate, but I think the general topic that you're raising, which is are we being consistent, is a good topic for board orientation, but I would defer to board. Uh, 
Um, and just to make clear, I did read the agenda notes, but I always try to do things. I always like to have the public know what we're doing. So I think it's worthwhile that when we get to something like this, that you state for the record that these requests are consistent with law and um, the contract. So they're not asking for something unusual. And then the second issue is something I think we have to figure out what we're going to do about. Yeah. Thank you. All those in favor? All right. Um, item H, consideration to approve an extended leave of absence request for high school teacher Sarah Steiner during the 2011-2012 school year. And I think the letter's in your packet. Um, do I have a motion, please? Um, I move to approve the extended leave of absence requested for high school teacher Sarah Steiner during the 2011-2012 school year. I have a second. Second. Um, any further discussion, questions? Um, I did have a, a question. Um, the extended leave of absence, exactly what um, span of time does that cover? And um, are, there, are there portions of that section of time that are covered under different um, regulations? So the first 12 weeks, as you know, are covered under FMLA. The additional time is without compensation, and the teachers are responsible beyond that, picking up that their share of the health insurance, uh, the portion of the health insurance cost that otherwise would be paid by the district. So um, in this particular case, we're running from the end of February through the end of the school year. The teacher doesn't return to work until August, but July and August are not typically teacher work months. Thank you. Anyone else? One further point. Just again, Meredith, it would be helpful. I, I know the answer to this, but again, it would be helpful to state it for the record that in addition to whatever this request is in compliance with law and contract, it would also be helpful to, the, the, to assure the public this is sort of a due diligence that, that there is adequate coverage in whatever school for when someone wants to leave during mid school year or the following year. We have what you've done, you've talked to DLT and, and they feel that there's, we can adequately do this talk to the DLT and we feel we can adequately do this and we do have coverage. Thank you. You're quite welcome. All right, all those in favor? Great. Um, item number nine, committee reports. I think we, um, were you prepared to discuss I, yes. finance quickly? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, that's my last duty as the mm -hmm. previous finance chair. Um, we met on November 29th for the second of three workshops to discuss the big, the big drivers um, in the budget. The first workshop was around district um, financial audits and controls. Um, the second, in the second workshop, we heard uh, very comprehensive um, reports from um, three different departments, facilities, transportation, and food services. And I would like to thank Greg Marles and Janet Hoskins and Peter Esposito for their work in, pursuit in, in uh, producing and presenting those reports. And the final of those workshops will be run by Michael Moore and will be held, I believe, on January 24th. Um, and I think we'll address uh, demographics, uh, programmatic changes, um, and staffing. Thank you, John, and thank you again for your service as uh, finance chair last year. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, school board agenda requests. David, you've already brought one up. Um, the iPads. Yes. Um, okay. And so that's been noted. Any other agenda requests for um, our next meeting? You um, can certainly call Meredith or myself if something comes up. Um, and that goes for the public as well. Um, item number 11, announcements of upcoming meetings. There is no policy date, but we will otherwise not meet until 2012. The regular board meeting is January 13th. There is a co-curricular steering committee meeting, which is my committee, but Elizabeth is the board representative to that committee, so that meeting will be held this Thursday. Thursday, 3.50. When you say there's no policy date, is your intention that there would be a policy meeting this month? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. <laughs> he said with fear. Thank and you. <laughs> I'm prepared to, to have a policy meeting. Let's He's meet on Christmas Eve. <laughs> <laughs> bah, bah, bah. Oh, okay. Well, um, thank you very much. And um, so, do I have a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn. Okay, do I have a second? Second. <laughs> Our new board members. <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. I know. Thank wow. You guys.